It's simple, really. Great stories with a good cup of tea. It's the Tea with Mike show. All right, guys, welcome uh, to another story. Uh, I'm Tea with Mike. Uh, joining me today to talk about writing, uh, comic, comics, and everything he's uh, ho- hopefully passionate about is uh, Luke Moore. Welcome to the show, man. Howdy. Thanks for having me. Yeah, cheers. So let's mix it up. So uh, <laughs> what type of tea are you drinking? Uh, today, I decided to be uh, a little bit more humble and go with peppermint tea because uh, all of my fancy expensive teas I've now run out of in my two weeks of self-quarantine. I'm not going crazy. What are you talking about? <laughs> and, and would you say you're a, a bit of a tea nerd? Do you, do you like drinking lots of uh, varieties of tea? I, I definitely do. My favorite is probably... Um, uh, Yogi puts out a really nice Egyptian tea, which is great. Okay. I love Bengal tea, but uh, yeah, I mean, um, I, I guess I like flavored hot water. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very nice. Uh, and as always, <clears throat> I'm drinking a nice strong uh, Yorkshire tea, and it's very strong uh, black tea with a tiny bit of milk in. Oh, charming. So kind of the reverse is when I was a kid, you used to have the similar tea, but used to pour like half a liter of milk in it, so it's kind of like the reverse. Oh, yeah. And, and yeah, so that's, our... That's uh, wife likes it. <laughs> and so our uh, tea fact for, the, uh, for today's story is, in the Victorian era, uh, they had special tea cups um, that actually uh, protected those people that uh, had, uh, like, mustaches, and, and, and that was to prevent the, tea, the tea, tea getting, like, dunked all over the mustache, basically. And that comes from kickassfacts.com. So for me personally, it wouldn't have been useful, as you can see, uh, but maybe some other people. I, I, that blows my mind that there's specialty tea cups for mustaches. Yeah, they used, used to be, but this is back in the uh, Victorian era. So, oh. so, so I know from the Victorian era, I'd be uh, a little bit more being from England, that obviously there's a bit of a class system in place. So the tea at that time was definitely... For the upper class, it was because they used to go out for afternoon tea, et cetera, and they, they all used to dress up. So definitely not um, for the average folk. I just imagine uh, someone saying, look, he has a milk mustache on his mustache. He is a working class man. <laughs> <laughs> nice, man. Uh, okay, so do you, do you want to tell everyone a, a little bit about you and what brings you here today to tell your story? Absolutely. Um, so as uh, Mike mentioned, my name is Luke. I am uh, the creator of the comic series Ever After, which looks like this. And uh, right now it's still in a bit of a um, pre-development phase, but uh, I mean, about seven years ago I started writing this thing and now I'm almost done writing the entire series all 700 pages or so. I've kind of lost count. I'm not crazy. What are you talking about? And uh, <laughs> yeah, um, very, very soon I'll be relaunching the Kickstarter. I was actually going to be starting it a few weeks ago, but uh, with the current state of the world, I thought that maybe I should just hold off until everything yes, settles definitely, down. Definitely more strategic. I'm holding off on a few things too, really by like trying to work on everything else and like consolidate and make it the best it can move can be obviously absolutely the, and the, 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 i really don't think that for that if someone came to me and said yeah I, I could have bought food for my family but i bought your comic instead like, <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, anyway it's the different... uh sorry uh the story itself is a high fantasy about a bard who inexplicably summons an apocalyptic avatar of chaos but she quickly learns that maybe history didn't remember him as accurately as she thought <laughs> So, very, very cool. Like, yeah. so, 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 what's kind of the like the, the background? What's the environment, the setting that this kind of takes place in this adventure? And what's yeah, what's the genre? The style? So, uh, it's yeah. uh, definitely a high fantasy. I uh, tried to keep the tone light, but definitely with some uh, dramatic elements in it, just for variety, of course. And uh, the story itself really focuses on how history can be very easily changed all depending on who's telling it and then it's only through the eyes of the people who experience it can we get um, a reliable account and even then okay. that's kind of okay. suspect so uh the whole story follows veladir who is you know i'll just show you the sticker here 
is Veladir. Move, move it over. Move it over to the right. So, okay, 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 so we got uh, Veladir on the loot. And this is her story as she starts as a uh, homeless bard and she accidentally sings a song about the Avatar Chaos, who is Adlerin, who is the dude in the mask. Yeah, good. Yeah. And uh, he returns and they interact with each other and she quickly realizes that maybe he's not as bad as history makes him out to be. But, you know, he is basically he's the first step of the apocalypse. So difficult to really know who's in charge and the whole story is about kind of learning about um man i say about a lot the whole <laughs> the whole story is kind of a um coming of age story mixed with a taking responsibility kind of story that no one is too wicked to change but you really have to do a lot in order to be forgiven that kind of deal so it's a also, high fantasy lots of uh with some philosophical um uh, tendencies thrown in there as well, but nothing. Cool. I like to think it's nothing too pretentious, but I like to think a lot of things. <laughs> also, and then in t so then in uh, terms of length, is this like a one-off, or is, or do you hope to extend it into a longer series with multiple events that occur within this world that you're building? Oh yeah. So uh, the the Kickstarter that I'm doing is to fund the first chapter of the first volume. Um, quick, quick tip to all aspiring comic makers, do not write an epic series as your very first publisher. I definitely fell into that trap. So, I mean, um, right, uh, as of now, I have about 700 pages at the end of it. I, I planned out about 900 pages throughout this entire series, but, uh, just to kick off, I'm trying to get the first 38 um, funded just just to make sure that my artists can eat and um, so we, to answer your question yes it's going to be a longer series but there's a definite beginning and a definite end I okay. uh, there's I'm once I'm done all these 900 pages I am absolutely not writing more <laughs> I, want to, <laughs> I want to move on to some other projects as much as I love this one but um, I, I always prefer stories that have a definitive end uh, nice man. So let, let's take it back a little bit. So obviously we, we now know that you're a big comic book writer and that's really where you, your passion lies. But how did you also kind of get started in the more broader subject of uh, writing? Well, um, ever since I was a little kid, I always wanted to write stories and uh, especially I wanted to write comics because as I as I grew up and learned how to read, I discovered quickly that I'm very dyslexic. So uh, writing prose takes me like three times as long as the normal person. And even then, there'll be times where I've accidentally reread re a whole chapter, but it didn't clue <laughs> in to my brain that I was reading a totally different thing because the words were all mixed around. So it told almost a different story. <laughs> That's so funny. doing book, doing book reports in elementary school was a nightmare. So I, I mean, try doing book, book reports in elementary. Yeah, primary and school, I mean, yeah. and I really wanted to um, uh, share a fantasy story because I kind of find that's that's definitely a genre that's underrepresented in graphic okay. novels, especially to people like me who have a great difficulty reading. Because I love I love stories. I love especially fantasy stories where it's a new world, it's new creatures, this new fantastic idea that is so um, strange to us in the normal world. Okay. But, I mean, it, for many years I just couldn't read. Period. And then my love of um, my love of novels kind of blossomed again when I discovered audiobooks. Also, awesome, that. So, and then, and then, so just so, why do you think that particular uh, genre is um, underrepresented? Unre unre oh, well, under underrepresented. God, what are words? <laughs> no, I, I got you. Um, I don't know. I think it's just honestly, I think it's just kind of coincidence. Um, and in my experience, uh, writing the manuscript and working with uh, working with my editors, they often tell me that. Um, a big part of fantasy because you're establishing a new world with rich lore it's really difficult to try and compact everything that you want to say mm. into a picture with just dialogue boxes in interesting because it because 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 you're building it from scratch it could be like oh it's it's endless the possibilities isn't it to what this like world could look like 
exactly and, and a big um a big problem that i have um is i hate the idea of just writing exposition because it's almost like hey, here's a comic book inside is a history lecture hope you enjoy it it's it's not as much fun as it sounds so i mean i with i do have some background in writing for film so there's there's good ways and bad ways to incorporate your lore into the book and unfortunately, I mean, at the end of the day, I just had to leave a lot of it out of um, the story directly. But uh, it's what I really enjoyed about all this. It's, it's been a great learning experience to, for how to make it intriguing enough, but all at the same time, not boring your audience with just a, a, a totally fantastic or not fantastic, fantastic Cole uh, history lecture. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's a very uh, quick way to lose your audience. And honestly, that that's the challenge across it. like any medium, like whether it's podcasting, writing, theater, performance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's the biggest challenge for anyone is like keeping the audience interested. And it's really difficult in 2020, and yeah. with 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 all, kind of all the noise of the world going on, and just people's attention span is it's not what what it once was. Yep, and I mean that's. I know lots of people like to think, oh, you know, back in the good old days, people would sit and read a book. I honestly think this is just this is just a natural progression of the human mind. It's when you see one spectacle, you expect the next spectacle to be even greater. And sometimes all you can do is to try and keep up with it. So, see, so if I've understood you correctly, you're saying it's kind of the, these mediums are kind of transitioning uh, with us through the, uh, the everyday kind of events of human life. And it's evolving. Yeah, well, I always look at it as um, everything is always changing. And so what what um, people considered entertainment even 30 years ago is probably not going to be seen as terribly entertaining to people now. Very true. And there's no better, no better evidence of that than the movies we watch or even the books we read. Like, I absolutely loved the film Lord of the Rings. Yes. And trying to read it, I'm sure even without dyslexia would have been a mighty challenge that I could not do. <laughs> yes, that's true. I have read the Lord of the Rings book and watched the watched the movie, and and at times it's, it it was challenging to to like to connect the the, the dots. Yeah, I Harry, uh, Harry Potter a little bit easier, but Lord of the Rings was quite tricky. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Because all, because even though they're similar in some ways, I'd say the Lord of the Rings is more like mythical and fancy, fancy, fancy. What kind of talk? Fantastical. Now? Sure, there you go. Uh, yeah, versus versus like Harry Potter. Whilst it is like in a ma magical world, it's still a little bit more relatable because it's still physical characters. Yeah, and it's uh, and it's it's not it's not written to be. Uh, by English scholars, right? It's no. it's it's written to be enjoyed by everybody. Yeah, for entertainment. So so then obviously uh, with writing, have you done some uh, writing in the past in uh, broadcasting and filmmaking and film too? Oh yes, um, I uh, I went to school for um, radio and television broadcasting, and they do touch a lot on scripts for that as well. What did you go, um, Nate? I went to. Uh, uh, Mount Royal here oh, in Mount Royal. and um, and and as much as I as much as I loved it and you know I did learn a lot um, it was after I graduated and I did my internship with a film studio in Colombia oh, that's cool. where I really, yeah in South America I was I, I'm still kind of blown away at the idea that they accepted me in the first place but <laughs> um, it was after that that's kind of where I realized that um, film is really kind of more the world that I enjoy. And I mean, I've always been writing just as a hobby. Like it's, to me, that's the ultimate way to relax is just to create another world where you have, where you feel you have more control over your life. Oh, interesting. And um, from there, you know, I, I constantly, I watch um, review series on YouTube. I read tons and tons and tons of book reviews and movie reviews just to try and, see you know what works what doesn't work the kind of audience that i want to appeal to and especially cliches because i find there's just 
there's um, no way you can write a purely original character. It's always going to be some similarities to something else. But what the ultimate test of a good writer is how you can make that cliche work in a new way, or in at least an enjoyable way. Gotcha. Um, so, 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 so of the three, it, it's definitely uh, writing for um, co comics, uh, your kind of favorite type of writing? Absolutely. Um, I, I kind of write them, the format that I write my comics is very indicative of the fact that I was taught how to write um, film scripts. Like it's yes. not, it's not the perfect um, format that you, you'd you submit to DC, Marvel or Image. Um, gotcha. And, and I mean, I if that is the direction that my career would take me, of course I would learn, but I'm very, I'm fortunate enough to work with uh, artists that I know face to face and we can talk about it and stuff like that. So, oh, as you're, as you're documenting it at the same time. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and the way I always context. look at it is, um, um, if it's something that is practical and down to earth as possible, then I could shoot this as a film if I wanted. Okay. But if it's a little bit more, like if, if you need millions and millions of dollars to produce this sort of thing, try making it, then just go with a comic. Oh. <laughs> like I love, I love reading, but at the same time, I also love movies. So it's like every once in a while, I'll, I'll come up with a great short story. And then I just think, well, you know, I could, I could uh, find an artist to do a great job with this. But, but you know, I also have some great actor friends who want to get this project on, you know, a few more projects under the belt. So we'll go with that direction. Awesome. And then, so, uh, do, do, do you write, are you lucky enough to call writing your full-time profession? No, because I'm not paid to do any of the stuff that I do. It's definitely something that would be nice in the future. Um, but uh, the reason why I'm going with uh, Kickstarter on this is that I really want to spread the message to everyone about my story. And if I, if I could even sell these at cost, you know, make sure that my bills are paid, my artist bills are paid, we have everything printed out and s distributed, then I would call that a success. Because at the end of the day, all I really want is to tell a story to a ton of people. If I don't become a millionaire, that's just life. I have i don't know what I would do with a million dollars anyway besides pay my bills or- <laughs> Exactly. And I see that, 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 that answer within itself brings up an interesting point about how, for, for me at least, uh, happiness uh, tri tri triumphs uh, money yeah and i mean i i have a roof over my head i have food in my fridge i got four animals who are very happy i have a wife who tells me she's happy through gritted teeth so i call that i call that all <laughs> of it. if they don't tell you any different then it, it, you doing good yeah the cats don't tell me different anyway <laughs> that's why you have cats don't you <laughs> yeah got yep cats and reptiles and a lot of you, 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 you touched on it a little bit, but do you want to expand on how kind of writing as, writing as a, a medium can um, positively kind of impact the world and the people that oh, come definitely. across it? Um, in my opinion, storytelling has always been used as a tool to help people learn and help people think critically. Um, um, and what, or to just basically inspire them to think for themselves. And I always think that a good allegory can be entertaining and at the same time make someone realize, oh, these characters did a bad thing or these characters did a good thing or they could, you know, oh, what if these characters did this instead? I mean, most people, just about everyone learns these things through their own experience or the stories that other people tell them. But yes. the no, the themes of the story are just as impactful, even if the story never happened. So, um, like, I, I think that, you know, writing fantasy is such a great thing because it inspires the imagination because it's so different from our own world. But at the same time, a good writer can make you see all these elements of their characters relate to you or relate to things in your life just in a different way and how you know, this molds you as a person to act in the future. Okay. Nice. Gotcha. And then, so let's see what. 
so so have you so when we're talking about broadcasting and filmmaking or even uh, co- comics have you tried out any of the uh, other elements by just uh, writing like, I mean, so um, like directing I'm... or editing or oh yeah I yeah, um that, that sort of thing like I, I still do um, videography on the side as much as I can. I used to be in um, the Camry Union as a trainee uh, for oh, film. Oh, that's fine, Atsu. Yes, and uh, cool. I've uh, I've decided to um, actually go more into prop uh, for that for IATSE. That's just something I enjoy a little bit more. Um, but yeah, like just as for many passion projects and for many uh, corporate videos, I still do a lot of um, a lot of um, writing, like just kind of corporate, bo- boring corporate stuff. Uh, but, it, shoot, but it helps pay the bills, which is important, so you can do the fun stuff, right? Yes, exactly. Um, it, it's much it's much easier to uh, to write when you're relaxed, and it's easier to be relaxed when all your bills are paid. That's a, that, um, that was a good twist there. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Throw that on a t-shirt. I'll wear it. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so, um, and the, the way I see it is that, you know, um, I'm trying to live, live a life that I feel much more accomplished with do with skills that I really enjoy. And so I, I always try and focus on, focus on things like that. Like, yeah, a corporate script isn't as much fun as writing a fantasy graphic novel. But at the same time, it's still more fun than being an accountant, in my opinion. They go right. I, you want know, being an accountant? More power to you. We definitely need those. <laughs> yeah, we need people to do everything in the world, so, so there's not an over-demand in one and an under-demand in another area. Yes, sure. we, we definitely need people to work in grocery stores, especially yes. right now. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think I think yeah. Now more than ever, it's emphasized uh, how certain we've got certain things like that are mixed up and kind of broken in society and what's really ultimately important is as we see now in the in what's going on in the world yeah and that's also why i like to write stories that do not take place in this world it's nice to get away (laughs) at least a couple of pages for sure and then then so obviously we know you're an avid writer by now if people were paying attention um what type of like if you like, do you have a studio? Like, what what's your like setup and environment like when you're getting well, um, into the writing space? Uh, well, if you can kind of see, this is this is my office. This is where I keep all my art and. Yeah, it, it looks very creative. Do you, you play musical instruments too? I do. As a matter of fact, I have my guitar one here, and then my other guitar, and then my bass, and then my other guitar, and my other other guitar. I really <laughs> like doing things. So, yeah, and it's um, especially when I'm trying to get into a writing headspace, um, like I keep a note. I always love to um, to write it down physically first. Yes, me too. Because in my mind, um, I always remember things that I wrote down better than I type them because it's uh, the muscle movement is associated with the word in my head. So that way there's more stimulus to my own memory as to what I wrote and when, which is a few more steps than me pushing the buttons. And as well, you know, it gives me another chance to reread it as I'm putting it in the computer and I can think, oh, you know, did this work, did that work? How can I change this at least once more before I send it to my Yes, editor? I quite agree. Uh, that, yeah. that's... And, sorry, just uh, another quick tip for all aspiring writers out there. Pay editors to go through everything that you write if you wanted to show it to a lot of people. Even if they get it back and they seem really mean, they're far nicer than hearing all these things from a million different people. Like uh, one of my one of my volumes, I had to completely scrap. So okay. all all 153 pages, I had to start from scratch because I gave it to an editor. She said, um, "This is misogynist." this is homophobic, this is boring. And I looked at those on the screen and I couldn't believe it. And I just thought that is absolutely not uh, the message that I was trying to get it across. So maybe, maybe I got to try again. And thankfully I did. And, you know, I took all of her, even her harshest words to, to thought and I, I put it to page and now I have a much, much better 
product. Awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So it's been open to feed, feedback, isn't it? And then even if you don't agree to the feedback, like t- take it in and maybe walk away for a while, do some yeah. other things, so you don't get frustrated and kind of like lose the work that you've uh, done exactly. so far. And it's especially if you manage to write it down and get someone else to read it. They're good at noticing where your imagination fills in the blanks because a lot of times, because you already know the story, the story's already in your head, and you just have to write it down. You will more than often not uh, put in a detail which is crucial to the whole thing, and forget to write that down. And all and to you it won't make any difference because you already know why, but yes. your reader doesn't. And uh, if you're yeah. writing for yourself, that's great. But if you want to write for others, you have to consider how well others are going to be able to interpret it. I think that's one of the hardest things too, because 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 you're also like wrapped up in the in this particular world or headspace, and often you put a lot of hours and bloods, like sweat, mm-hmm. lots of scrunched up paper or curse yep. words, um, depending on the on the medium. But yeah, yeah. But, but, but you are right. The the most important thing is how are others receiving it because ultimately you can love everything you're doing because we tend to be biased but if nobody else likes it then you're wasting time ultimately unfortunately exactly in the world that we live in right yeah and it's so it's always good to um to be in the head to be humble enough to accept the fact that maybe you're not as good as you think you are but you aren't dead therefore you always have the potential to improve that's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's, it. That's, it. That's, it. That's like the second good quote of the episode. Let's let's get a couple of tea of uh, uh, tea with Mike mugs on the shop, and we'll just fill them up with quotes. I, I I'll consider that. Like that that is a th- thing that I'm working towards post like virus. So right now I'm just really like building the audience. No, that's great. I also love the notion of post virus 2020. <laughs> Post virus time. I know, but it won't be original because, like, lots of people will do it, though. Well, yeah, but remember, using a cliche in an original way is a good thing. Nice. So, <laughs> so, so, so as we move towards the end, do, do you want to tell us, like, how, how musical you are? Like, how often do you play the guitar? Do, do oh, you do um, it when you're not writing? Or, or do you play the guitar and then get you in the headspace for writing? <laughs> Um, it's definitely one of the avenues that I, I get to, uh, to try and get the creative juice kind of flowing a little bit. Um, I've been playing guitar since I was 14. Um, I, I like to think that I started playing the guitar well when I turned 20. Um, and a lot of it really improved when I started editing. I don't, I don't edit full time anymore, but, uh, because my computer was so cluttered with, uh, projects and rendering and, um, and um, exporting. Uh, that's when I would play guitar a lot. So suddenly I was practicing for like two to three hours every single day. And I got really good at that point. Very cool. Yeah, but I um, like to get in the headspace for, for writing. Uh, playing guitar is always great because that warms up your fingers. It kind of it makes you think ahead. It uh, stimulates a little bit of adrenaline. Another thing that I love to do to help me write is running. So okay. Whenever I um, whenever I run, I put on some you know some fast paced. Uh, I really love power metal. Put on some uh, power metal, and that kind of helps me think about battle sequences. And you know, in a fantasy book, that's more than likely going to happen. But I always find that with uh, you know your blood pumping, with um, adrenaline going through your head, suddenly you you think much, or at least I do anyway. I think much more clearly. So all of a sudden, I will just get a stroke of genius of, oh, my story didn't work before. Now it does. Let me go wipe the sweat off my brow and go write this down right away. And that that kind of helps me, you know, flush out scenes, flush out gotcha. uh, character motivations. I've I've developed some great lines of dialogue mid sprint at the gym. I'm I feel sorry for whoever sees me at the gym because out of nowhere, <laughs> I'll, I'll just stump down and go, oh, that's it. He could say this, and this would go yeah. to this. Oh, I am such a great writer. Oh. <laughs> Very good. And then, and, and then, so I, I guess the last thing that I really want to ask you is, what's uh, it's a bit random, but what, what's the 
what's uh, when, when you've sat down in a single session like what what length of time have you like kind of ridden for like the longest um see another thing another issue that i have with myself is uh i'm I'm very ADHD, so I can't sit and stare at a, a screen for very long. That's part of why I don't edit it anymore is because it was it was painful for me to just sit there and focus. But um, at one of my old jobs, um, I worked at a hotel. It was up to me to, uh, you know, make sure that the audio visual for events was going down well. And every once oh, in a while, cool. I would have to supervise another company in my ballroom while they set up. So basically, yeah. uh, that is me just kind of walking around. So I'd walk around with, oh, I don't, oh, I do have it here. I'd walk around with this, you know, a nice, plain, basic looking portfolio. I'd have a couple <laughs> of pages in it. That was just like, oh, you know, they loaded in here. This is the gear, notes, whatever, three pages over. That was all my manuscript. So I would walk around and go, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, I'm going to point here. Yeah, uh -huh, I'm going to point there. Uh huh. And then Atherin swings his mighty hook into his foe, leading <laughs> the curling scream. And look up, yeah, and I'm just going to take a few steps over here. No one ever caught, caught me doing that. So I guess my longest writing session pretending to work was about five hours. Okay. So That's just, fine. And the only way I could have stayed focused on writing that long is because I was on my feet and because I was walking around. And because in the back of my mind, I'm just thinking, okay, I have to look convincing enough. I have to look like <laughs> I'm doing my job. And I did get in trouble a little bit because the company that I was supervising while they were uh, loading in their gear complained to my boss saying, this guy was walking around taking notes on literally everything we did. <laughs> it was so uncomfortable how he watched us like a hawk noting everything. <laughs> and all I could think is like, Nope, I don't even remember you coming in. I was busy writing some fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> what did your boss say? He said, well, you uh, you took notes. You did a good job. Here's your pay. Nice. That's not bad. Go yep, I, uh, I, I've gotten away with some things. <laughs> Haven't we all? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> all right, cool. Well, well, that's kind of a wrap on, on the show today. So thanks for uh, being on the Tea with Mike show. My pleasure, sir, and have a good one. Stay healthy. Yeah, you too. You too. Doodaloo. It's the Tea with Mike show.